Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webcast. My name is Christine Dursey Davis. I'm the executive director of the Ohio chapter of the American Planning Association, and I am your webcast moderator. Today, we will be hearing the presentation, Resilience in Vulnerable Communities When Climate Change Forces Relocation. Here we go. For technical help during today's webcast, you can type your questions in the chat box found in the GoToWebinar tool panel. And for your content questions related to the presentation, again, just type those in that chat box in your GoToWebinar tool panel, and we will answer those at the end of the presentation during the Q&A. Today, we are sponsored by the APA Housing Community Development Division. So thanks to you for joining us. You're gonna hear a little bit more about them and the good uh, activities that they have coming up here um, today and the next couple of weeks. So we'll look forward to hearing from Rachel here in a second. This session has been approved for 1.5 CM credits for live viewing. You can log those credits by heading over to planning.org and logging into your My APA account. From there, you can either search by today's title or event number, both of which can be found on our webcast webpage. Um, which is ohioplanning.org slash planning webcast. And there you'll also be able to register for all of our upcoming sessions. Uh, we have a ton coming down the pipeline. We're just getting all the information ready for it to uh, get registration up and live. And hopefully by Monday, we'll have a new website uh, for our planning webcast series. I keep making changes and little edits to it so it hasn't gone live, even though I've been saying for three weeks that it We'll be going live soon. Uh, so watch for that. It'll be exciting to have a, a, a nice, more user-friendly website uh, to house, house all of our great content. And make sure you like us on Facebook. Just search Planning Webcast Series and we'll pop up. That's where I post any important information like date or time changes or when we have new webcasts available for you to register for. And also head over to YouTube and subscribe to our channel. We record all of our sessions and post them on our YouTube channel at the conclusion. Um, and just head over to YouTube and type in planning webcast and we'll show up along with our over 300 videos. We have over, I don't know, 3,200 subscribers. So be sure to join and subscribe and you'll get notified when we have sessions coming up. Um, so I think that's it again. Just type those questions in as you have them. We'll answer them at the Q&A at the end of our session. Um, and with that, I am going to turn it over to Rachel Smith, who is going to give a little overview of this series. So Rachel, I just sent the controls over to you. Yep. Yeah. And hopefully you guys can see my screen. Perfect. Okay. Um, so thank you all so much for, uh, oh, you still see? Mm -hmm. Yep, we're good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> thank you all for joining us today for this uh, series. We have uh, two presentations, uh, two webinars that we're doing that's focused on community resilience in vulnerable communities. Today's session is focusing on communities uh, facing climate change. And the next part of the series is going to be on February 19th which will be focusing on uh, development pressures and how communities, the Golod Geechee community is dealing with that and preserving their community. Um, and I also wanted to mention, we do have one uh, other webinar that we're uh, working, partnering with the Ohio division on uh, called The Shame of Chicago, The Color Tax on February 12th. And then in March, we're gonna have several more webinars focused on middle, missing middle housing. So please stay tuned. Um, you can reach out to me um, or the division at the email you see on the screen, um, and I hope you enjoy the session today. Thanks. Can everybody see okay. that? Okay. Yep, you look good. Okay, thanks so much. So, hi everybody. Um, my name is Sally Russell Cox, and I work for the State of Alaska Division of Community and Regional Affairs. I manage the division's community resilience programs, and I've been working with rural Alaskan communities, primarily Alaska Native villages, on ways to adapt to environmental threats, such as erosion, flooding, and permafrost thaw, 
for 15 years. During this time, I've managed several programs which specifically deal with climate impacts to small communities. And I'd like to provide you with some, some highlights of this work. I'd like to first provide some background specifically on rural Alaska. More than one third of all federally recognized tribes in Alaska are in Alaska, most based in rural Alaskan communities. The average population in a rural Alaskan community is less than 500 people. Most rural communities are accessible only by plane and boat, um, not connected to a road system. Most are engaged in subsistence activities that provide nearly all their food needs. 144 indigenous rural communities are at risk to some degree of infrastructure damage from erosion, flooding, and or permafrost thaw. And 95% of these 144 communities are small and low income. Fuel is extremely expensive in rural Alaska. In some communities, it's as high as $10 per gallon. There is great diversity among the first people of Alaska, diversity across cultures, languages, life ways, worldviews, art forms, and histories. There are 11 distinct indigenous cultures in Alaska that can be described geographically, shown here on this map. And among those 11 cultures, there are at least 20 native languages. Most Alaska native communities are tribally based. Many of these tribal groups were nomadic prior to settling in Alaska native villages as we know them today. Um, one of the largest influences of village settlement was the establishment of a school in each village. The schools were often built at a, a seasonal subsistence camp where a group of people may have been temporarily gathered, but not a lot of consideration was given to site suitability or whether Western infrastructure and buildings were an appropriate use for the Arctic and subarctic environment. So where Alaska's first people could once easily pick up and move, they are now tied to stationary villages where infrastructure and buildings are being impacted by environmental threats such as erosion, flooding, and permafrost thaw. Yet they are deeply connected to the places they live, um, which goes beyond the actual village itself. Um, they are connected both physically and spiritually. Alaska's indigenous communities are experiencing some of the most devastating impacts of a warming climate. Alaska is warming twice as fast as the national average. Alaska Native communities are well aware of the effects of this warming, from a loss of barrier sea ice that makes communities more vulnerable to the impacts of sea storms, to increased precipitation and wave action, storm surges, increased flooding, erosion, and thawing permafrost. Now I'm going to show you some real life examples of environmental threats in rural communities. So this is um, of ice jam flooding on the Yukon River in the village of Galena. Erosion. Um, this one is of erosion in the village of Newtok. And the large photo was taken during my first trip to Newtok in the summer of 2006. The inset photo was taken um, in the summer of 2019, 13 years later. And note the amount of land that's been lost to erosion. Um, the homes that are at the very beginning of that lower photo are now gone. Erosion has taken them away. And this is what happens to infrastructure in the communities with um, thawing permafrost. This is a boardwalk in the village of Newtok, which is shifting due to subsidence. <clears throat> Alaska communities are responding to environmental threats in several ways that, for planning purposes, can be grouped into three primary categories. Protection in place is the use of shoreline protection measures and other controls to prevent or minimize impacts, allowing the community to remain in its current location. Managed retreat involves moving part of the community away from hazard prone areas to locations in or adjacent to the community. And relocation involves moving the entire community to an entirely different location, not located, uh, not connected to the current site. This is considered the option of last resort. Um, it's not unusual for communities to combine these approaches, um, especially a community that um, is looking at relocation over the long term. So these are some real life examples of adaptation measures in Alaska Native villages. Uh, this is the rock revetment built to protect the village of Kivalina, which is on a barrier island. 
This is a managed retreat in the village of Mipakiak. The community is moving infrastructure away from the eroding riverbank in the foreground to higher ground. And this is the village of Newtok's relocation site on Nelson Island, where one third of the population has already relocated. The adaptation process can be described in three phases illustrated here. Each phase builds upon the other. The first is the data collection and risk assessment phase, which results in the community's understanding of risk, which is critical for the next phase, planning and decision making. During the planning phase, decisions are made about preferred solutions and actions, and strategies are developed for local actions to reduce risk. The final phase is implementation, when the community actually carries out the preferred solutions or actions. This phase goes beyond studies and planning to actually constructing solutions. There are significant challenges to development in rural Alaska. About 60% of Alaska's communities aren't connected by roads, and there are vast differences between villages, which leads to really high transportation costs. There are limited local resources for community development projects, which increases the cost when everything has to be barred to the community. The harsh temperatures of remote Alaska contribute to these costs and challenges, as does the shortage of remote construction workers. Rural communities are vulnerable for several reasons. The technical expertise needed to carry out complex adaptation projects is often a large professional leap from the traditional roles of com community members. A lack of redundancy in village infrastructure increases the impact of environmental threats. If a facility is damaged and stops working, it affects everyone in the village. And communication outside the community can also be very limited. Developing housing in rural Alaska is a very expensive endeavor. In most cases, the total cost of development will far exceed the appraised value of a new house and the ability for the potential homeowner to pay. Total development costs in remote Alaska typically range from $450,000 to $750,000 a unit, and this is for a basic three to four bedroom home. Infrastructure construction typically costs millions of dollars, Piped water and sewer may never be feasible in many rural communities. There are about 48 rural communities right now that still have no running water or flush toilets. And the burden of connecting homes to utilities is on the housing developer, which in a rural community is usually the tribe or the local housing authority or a community organization, which may not have the resources to do so. These development challenges have in turn impacted housing stock. Overcrowding is nearly 12 times the national average in some rural communities. Many homes are not built for harsh winter weather. Many rural homes receive a one-star energy rating, which means the home requires at least four times the energy of a new home built to state standards. And I mentioned that fuel is extremely expensive in rural Alaska, so that's an additional burden. Poor ventilation in homes results in widespread mold and community residents with respiratory illnesses. Environmental threats to infrastructure can exacerbate existing stressors faced by communities, such as overcrowding, which I've mentioned, lack of housing, access to clean water, increased accidents and injuries, food insecurity, and decreased mental health. So I'd like to talk about the village of Newtok as an example. I worked with a number of environmentally threatened communities over the years, but I worked with Newtok the longest, and I've learned the most lessons from them. And they right now are the only community that's actively re relocating. In early 2006, when Newtok's tribal council asked the state of Alaska to assist with Newtok's relocation effort, the tribe had already accomplished some key steps in the relocation process on their own. <clears throat> about 10 years of erosion studies, um, after about 10 years of erosion studies in the 1980s, the tribe came to the conclusion that relocation would be the only feasible option to stay together as a community. And they reached consensus and made a formal decision to relocate in 1993. Shortly thereafter, they identified characteristics they wanted in a new village site and then reviewed alternative sites and made a decision. Because their preferred site was on federal land within the Yukon Delta National Wildlife Refuge, 
they had to go through a very lengthy negotiation process with the Department of the Interior to go through a land exchange to acquire land, uh, to acquire title to the land. So by the time I began working with New Talk in 2006, more than 20 years had already passed. The big challenge now is getting funding and support, in, and support to develop the new village. For an effort like this, it made sense to bring together all of the entities that normally provide assistance to rural communities. The idea was that the community and agencies had a chance to meet face to face on a regular basis to develop a path forward. We learned very quickly that there were many advantages to this process. The community doesn't just have a seat at the table, they drive the process. Strong trusting relationships develop, both community to agencies and agency to agency. And it isn't a bureaucratic process, although it would seem to be. A lot of creative brainstorming takes place during these meetings with many opportunities to collaborate and leverage resources. In the first few years, we focused on developing pioneer infrastructure that would support the development of the new community. And planning the relocation effort from the conceptual planning of the new town site, which went through many iterations, to developing the first community driven relocation plan, which is still guiding development at the new village site. One of the ways we ensured that New Talk's culture was prioritized and that the planning process was community driven was to have the tribal council establish guiding principles for the relocation effort that the agencies agreed to. Many of New Talk's traditional values were incorporated into this process, such as looking to elders for guidance, nurturing spiritual and physical well being, respecting and enhancing the environment, designing with local input, and hiring community members first. By 2018, the final subdivision plot for the new village was platted and recorded. Enough homes and basic infrastructure had been built to support the first residents. And in the fall of 2019, the first community members, about one third of New Talk's population, permanently settled at the new village site. So housing has been the single greatest priority and greatest challenge. In order for all New Talk residents to move to the new village site, they must have housing. Few homes in New Talk are in suitable condition to be relocated to Muxavik, the new village site, and few families in New Talk have the income to support a conventional mortgage, but there has been innovation. Here you see a home that was designed by the Cold Climate Housing Research Center, a nonprofit research organization that focuses on any energy efficient, cost effective housing in Alaska. This house was built by a local work crew and is extremely energy efficient and movable. As you can see in the photo in the lower right hand um, corner, the house was built on a skittable foundation and can be towed across the ice or tundra when needed. It contains a small water treatment plant and a generator, which can be used before public utilities are available at the new site. Funding for housing at Muxavik has come through conventional and unconventional sources. Conventional funding sources include HUD's NAHASTA program and the Bureau of Indian Affairs Housing Improvement Program. New homes have been in part funded through FEMA's Hazard Mitigation Grant Program by way of buyouts, where some of the most threatened homes at New Talk have been purchased at fair market value by FEMA, and that money has been applied to a new home at the new village site. FEMA's pre-disaster mitigation program has been used to develop housing crowds. In 2019, Alaska's congressional delegation was able to allocate $15 million to the relocation effort, and these funds were used to build additional cold climate homes. And then more recently, New Talk has used CARES Act funds to build COVID isolation units, which will later be reverted to community housing. In order to ensure equity and prioritize affordable housing, the New Talk Village Council developed housing policies which identify how families will become eligible for housing based on level of threat and income. The policies were developed by the tribe and their attorney and reviewed by state and federal agencies with, federal, uh, with housing expertise. The housing policies complement other policies for the relocation effort, such as procurement and purchasing policies and construction standards. 
Some of the lessons learned from Utah definitely apply to other communities in Alaska. The importance of a community-driven approach, which empowers and honors community decision-making, sovereignty, and self-determination, and prioritizes local workforce development. The importance of engaged partnerships and governmental coordination to address funding and technical assistance gaps. This requires collaboration, leveraging of resources, and coordination of expertise. The importance of data collection and risk assessments, which is foundational to community understanding of risk and making informed decisions about risk. And the likelihood of reprioritized development, because the speed and severity of environmental threats may necessitate the development of pioneering housing before final infrastructure is in place. So development may not happen in a conventional manner, and relocation steps may need to trigger the funding of specific infrastructure, such as establishing a population before an airport and school can be built. <clears throat> so how big is this problem in Alaska? Environmental threats to community viability is a growing concern. In 2019, a statewide threat assessment was completed, which assesses threats to infrastructure from erosion, flooding, and buying permafrost in 186 rural Alaskan communities. <clears throat> Excuse me. 144 communities were identified as being at risk to some degree of infrastructure damage from environmental threats, and this map shows the location of these communities. <clears throat> to wrap up, I wanted to speak briefly about an effort I have been involved with. Last year, the Bureau of Indian Affairs was asked by Congress to develop a report outlining the unmet infrastructure needs of tribal communities in Alaska Native villages who were in the process of relocating due to climate impacts. I and several of my colleagues were asked to serve on an Alaska expert research team for the part of the report on Alaska Native villages. I wanted to share the process we used to identify unmet infrastructure needs because I think it's significant for future efforts. I'm gonna take a quick drink of water. I have a little bit of a tickle in my throat. <clears> throat> To determine unmet infrastructure need, we looked at the difference between the total need, the amount of money needed over the next 50 years to protect infrastructure in threatened Alaska communities, and the amount of existing support available to federal programs. After a survey of many federal agencies, we estimated that in 2019, the amount of federal program funding to rural Alaskan communities to protect infrastructure was approximately $13 million. Our focus was on the 144 communities I mentioned earlier that were identified by the statewide threat assessment as being at risk to some degree of infrastructure damage from environmental threats. In order to estimate the unmet needs to protect infrastructure from these envi environmental threats, cost estimates were determined for these 144 threatened communities. Each community was evaluated on an individual basis during which the team made a professional judgment as to the expected mitigation strategy. The key assumption um, was that environmental threats can be addressed by mitigation actions. And it's important to note that the professional judgments don't represent community decision-making. Because of COVID, we weren't able to consult with the communities. And the costs are in $2020. But the estimates were pretty eye-opening. Based on the funding, uh, communities received from federal programs in 2019, which was $13 million per year um, over that year, the estimated unmet need is approximately $80 million per year over the next 10 years. Over the next 50 years, Alaska Native communities will face an estimated $3.5 billion in threats to infrastructure from erosion, flooding, and thawing permafrost. Obviously, flooding is going to be a challenge, possibly the single most important challenge for these communities in the future. <clears throat> An additional estimated $32 million will be needed just to conduct hazard studies and risk assessments in 119 communities who haven't been studied yet. The table on this slide shows the total cost estimates for different regions of Alaska. One of the things we have since explored is how existing resources can be better coordinated 
to fill the unmet need. We developed a proposed multi-agency framework based on FEMA's National Disaster Recovery Framework, but significantly scaled down and specific to Alaska. Rather than focusing on disaster recovery, this framework would focus on mitigation actions, what it will take to prevent a community from getting to an emergency situation. The framework is managed by state, federal, and tribal co-chairs, and is carried out through eight mitigation support functions, which you see on this slide. Community planning and capacity building, finance, housing, community infrastructure systems, protection and place systems, public health, education, and governance and culture. And this report will um, be completed, um, it's in the process of being completed, and it will be made publicly available this spring. It's actually undergoing review right now, um, and it will be made publicly available. Finally, another report I'm working on with the Department of the Interior, the Denali Commission, and the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium is a collaborative relocation framework which specifically addresses the role of federal and state programs in responding to the relocation needs of Alaska Native villages. And this, this report will also be coming out this spring. As you can see on the slide, we've outlined the different relocation phases that can take place during an incremental relocation process. The invitation to this webinar mentioned that I would share my work with four communities, and in the interest of time, I've only mentioned New Talk. I also work with the villages of Kivalina, Shak, Tuluk, and Shishwap to develop strategic management plans for their resilience. This work also involved organizing community interagency planning groups modeled after New Talk's experience, and I'm happy to take any questions about these communities as well during the Q&A part of this webinar, and thank you very much. Um, there we go. All right. Hello. My name is Chad Carson. Um, Sally, that was an excellent presentation. Um, I am uh, a little worried about going after that. <laughs> It was, uh, it was beautiful. So I am going to be zooming in to um, a one specific project. Um, hey, sorry, can you show your, said, your screen isn't showing? Oh, okay, let me, <laughs> let me take a moment. I figured by now it might be up, so I wanted to interrupt you. Uh, okay. Let me try to... Let's see here. Let me try to send it back to you again. Okay, I just resent you that that invite. Beautiful. Thank you. Great. Okay. Um, let me restart. So I'm Chad Carson. I am a project manager with the Louisiana Office of Community Development, and I'm the project manager over our resettlement of the Ildejon Charles uh, community. So um, just a general overview of where we're going with this presentation. I want to show you the past of the island and the present. I want to talk about how we applied for funding ultimately and have brought that to the point that we're under construction now. Um, we'll go over the process that we chose a resettlement site with the residents and how um, our co-design process has resulted in a plan for use of the land. And finally, some lessons learned uh, that hopefully can be applicable to other relocations. So first, this is Ile de Jean Charles. It is an island in the marshes of Lower Terrebonne Parish. And um, that's the Gulf of Mexico there, where it is, it is located in the bottom of our state. It's been inhabited um, easily since the early 1800s following the Indian Removal Act. And the people who have called it home since then are primarily of Native American ancestry. Uh, people lived a, um, 
an isolated life. It was not connected to the mainland until Island Road was developed in 1953. Uh, so people were trapping, hunting, farming, fishing, um, really providing for themselves on this, uh, this island. And you can see in the photos that the island has suffered significant land loss since um, since these photos were taken. In 1960, the island was 22,000 acres. Yet by 2019, it was only 320 acres. Only 2% of the land remains. Um, the factors are many that are causing this. Uh, sea level rise, uh, coastal erosion, and uh, human influence. All of these have, have resulted in uh, a very challenging present condition. So this is the island today. The island is surrounded by a ring levee, but as you can see, it's largely surrounded by open water. What once was marsh that would be a barrier to uh, storms that would pass through is now essentially open to the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, island Road, which I mentioned connects them to the mainland, is often inundated with water cutting the residents off from basic services, uh, jobs, um, emergency services, work. And over the years, the number of residents have dwindled on the island, but a core community still remained. Um, as of the time that we applied for funding to relocate this community, there were still 99 permanent residents living on the island. Um, that was in 2016, but the community continues to be battered by storms. It, Hurricane Barry came through um, in July of 2019, and the ring levee stood no chance. Um, the community was inundated by eight feet of water, and the ring levee held the water in until it was pumped out. So, Residents continue, even as we are uh, undergoing this relocation project, continue to be walloped by storms. As of today, there are still 30 households living on the island, uh, or pardon me, 30 occupants, people living on the island, occupying 14 homes. So now I want to run through how my agency got involved. Um, and the process that we've gone through to, to get this relocation uh, moving. So we heard about this community. It was brought to our attention um, through some nonprofit partners. And we applied for uh, funding through HUD's National Disaster Resilience Competition. And ultimately, we were awarded $48.3 million uh, for the resettlement of Ile de Jean Charles. And we started out, uh, we broke this into, it actually has four phases. So the first phase was uh, community data gathering, interacting with the residents, and getting an idea of what was uh, the current state of the island. After that, we did a more in-depth engagement process with the residents and evaluated potential sites for relocation. Um, eventually, we purchased a 515-acre tract uh, in Terrebonne Parish, same parish as where the Ile de Jean Charles is located. Uh, and finally, we have the development phase, which is where we currently are. So I'll zoom into each of these phases now. The goal was to depopulate the island completely and rebuild the community on higher, drier ground. So here's some uh, photos of our engagement happening here. Um, as I said, phase one was this initial outreach. Uh, we did a land use and infrastructure survey of the island. Uh, that's where that uh, lovely aerial photo came from in the previous slide. And we started getting some insight into uh, what the residents of the island wanted. Um, we found that they valued privacy, uh, the seclusion that the island offered, the access to the water right outside their home. Um, but they found it lacking, obviously, in safety and flood protection. Um, we also found that 
though they were eager to relocate, they wanted to continue to have access to the island uh, as their uh, traditional home. And as much as uh, one, as much as this one narrative of what people are interested in emerged, um, there were plenty of other island residents that had widely varying uh, interests in what their new community would look like. There was no single homogenous set of priorities that was shared by island residents. Um, in fact, as we learned more about the community, we uh, found that it was not even one homogenous group. Uh, we were under the impression that we were working with one tribe, and we found, in fact, there were at least four uh, groups of people on the island. There were people who were affiliated with the Ildijan Charles Band of Biloxi Chittimacha Choctaw. Um, that's the group that's most commonly identified with Ildijan Charles. But other residents were affiliated with another tribe, the United Homa Nation. Further, there were people who claimed native ancestry but did not affiliate with either of those two tribes and just described themselves as Choctaw but weren't engaged with any uh, organized tribe. And, and lastly, there were non-native um, residents as well. So uh, we quickly realized that we were going to have to um, build a big tent here, and we were going to have to get everyone's voices involved. As I mentioned before, we realized that people wanted access to the island, um, even after the, this relocation happened. And that caused our first major pivot in this project. We had planned on this being more or less a buyout program where the state would purchase uh, the land on the island and we would develop a new community um, and the residents would move and ultimately the island would return to nature and um, with each passing hurricane return to the sea. But we found that that was uh, unacceptable uh, to the residents. and we worked closely with HUD to find a sort of alternative framework for, for the relocation. And what that ended up looking like is the residents are retaining ownership of their land uh, on the island, and they're even retaining the structure. We're not demolishing them. The arrangement is that they can keep their house on the island, but they agree to relocate full-time to the new community. They can return to their house uh, for cultural reasons, for vacation, for uh, fishing, whatever they like, but they have agreed to relocate to the new community that we're developing. Also, there's the stipulation that the, in the event the homes on the island are damaged further, they're not allowed to make repairs to the homes. And we know that this area is gonna continue to experience hurricanes uh, even this last year was extremely active hurricane season for Louisiana. And this allows um, residents to gradually um, sort of re reevaluate where home is from the island to uh, the community that they have dubbed the New Isle. So as I said, the community participation on this was, uh, was extensive. We were gathering feedback from over 150 members of the Ilda Jean Charles community. And as I said, the population has been dwindling uh, over the years as hurricanes have hit the area. So we were engaged with not just the people on the island, but also the people who once called the island home. And we held community meetings where we were gathering this information. We were meeting in a firehouse that was right off the island. Um, and that led to formation of uh, design charrettes, formation of a steering committee that featured uh, island residents, but also featured uh, formal representatives of the tribes that are involved here. So the first uh, major decision point that we were encountering was selecting a site. We knew that we had to uh, find a place that was high and dry. Uh, in coastal Louisiana, that is a challenge. Uh, we vetted over 19 sites, and it was at our third community meeting 
that we were able to discuss the pros and cons of each site, um, look at the market value of the site uh, so that residents could understand their future property values. And we ultimately whittled this stack of, seven, uh, of 19 properties down to five configurations of three different sites. So they'd narrowed it down to five. And at that point, uh, we found all the properties met our requirements, met HUD requirements, and were suitable for development. So we let the residents choose. Uh, they submitted preference surveys. And ultimately, 78% of the residents chose one site. It was called the Evergreen site. And you can see its location relative to Ile de Jean Charles. It's 40 miles north in uh, Shriver, Louisiana, Shriver, Louisiana. And the site is, is gorgeous. Here it is, aerial view. It's 515 acres that when we purchased it were sugarcane. The center of the site, which you can see here, is wetlands. So we obviously were not developing on the wetlands. And this sort of guided the, the development of this site to be one that um, is integrated with nature. There are two waterways that naturally flow through the site. There's Bayou St. Louis and Bayou Blue. Uh, Bayou St. Louis is labeled on that slide. Bayou Blue is the one to the east. And this was a, a huge asset to the residents. They would be able to continue to have some connection to the water that was so integral to their lives on Ile de Jean Charles. So here's our first rendering of the, the New Isle community. We uh, worked with residents to understand what they wanted. And as I said earlier, they really enjoyed the solitude that the island provided. Um, residents were worried that they were essentially moving into a subdivision. And that is what we aimed to uh, avoid. We wanted to maintain that sense of solitude and let the residents have a place that they felt like was their own. So it wasn't just uh, the construction of homes, though. We also wanted to create a place for community activities and a place for commercial activities. Um, though the island uh, offered easy access to, to natural resources, fishing, uh, crabbing, things of that nature, it was very far from jobs. So we wanted to find a place that was also filled with economic possibility. We, in addition to the residences, are building a community center, a market building, uh, a festival grounds, and we're developing a commercial corridor. All of these that um, are assets to the residents, but also the commercial assets are revenue generating and they're going to feed revenue back into the community to offset some of the costs that are associated from moving to a very moving from a very old home uh, where the property values made the property taxes essentially non-existent um, to uh, a new house that will be appraised for significantly more and also the new home we're requiring that the residents carry homeowners and flood insurance. And we're able to subsidize those costs as well with the revenue generated from the commercial elements. You can kind of see this in this rendering, but um, we've really developed this to be a community where people are living with water. There's world-class stormwater management happening on, happening on the site. We've got a network of lakes and swales and then we've got the two bayous, really uh, so people could uh, embrace that part of island life, even on their new home. So here's a rendering of uh, one of four styles of homes that are gonna be built on the property. They're in this Acadian style that we found that residents wanted, that's sort of the architectural vernacular of that area. And they're not just in the traditional style, they're built uh, to above building code standards. And this goes back to trying to create 
um, a sustainable development that the residents will be able to live in for generations to come. We're trying to keep the ongoing costs as low as possible. So we've done that through two standards. Uh, the first is we are building to fortified gold. Uh, fortified is a code plus standard that is put out by the Institute for Business and Home Safety, uh, gold being the highest designation that they offer. And it's uh, a design standard that makes the home additionally resilient to hurricanes. So it has engineered load paths um, with all of the connectors tying the foundation to the walls to the roof. It has uh, enhanced roofing that will make sure that the roof stays on during a storm. And in the event that the roof doesn't stay on, we've got secondary water barriers to make sure that water doesn't come in. Um, those are, of course, practical advantages for a home uh, on the coast. But the other advantage of Fortified is that we're able to leverage those features to make the, the cost of insurance lower for the residents. Insurers see these features and know that going to reduce claims. And uh, while we have committed to subsidizing insurances uh, for the residents for up to 10 years, pardon, for at least 10 years, um, we know that for true sustainability, we need to make sure that costs remain low uh, for as long as possible. So we're trying to engineer that with this fortified standard. The other standard that we're adhering to is Energy Star. That's a requirement of our funds that uh, the house is Energy Star 3.0 certified. But the, the added bonus there is that it's keeping utility bills as low as possible for these residents. So here's a, a beautiful streetscape. What you can see here is that we've got this curving road. Um, we've got this sort of sweeping um, kind of a, a snake shape running through the community. And the lots have varying setbacks from the street. And the purpose here was to try and create that sense of solitude. You're not right on top of your neighbor, trying to, again, harken back to that island existence. Um, again, trying to avoid the look of a subdivision, so to speak. The homes all back up either to a water body or to undeveloped woods, that wetlands area. And again, we're trying to make sure that this feels as close to home as possible. When we got to the point that we were uh, having residents, when we were associating residents with specific lots in the community, um, we dreamed up a very complex system um, of ranking and uh, algorithms, and we pitched this in the community meeting, and we we uh, were shocked to hear the residents say, no, nah, let us figure it out ourselves. <laughs> so we found that the residents wanted to be grouped by family. Largely, the residents are related. So we ended up with these uh, clusterings of family groups, and we um, truly had uh, no interest in telling the residents where they were going to live within the development, and that family grouping worked perfectly. Uh, it's just an example of the flexibility that we realized we needed to have. We couldn't go into this with a prescribed method and expect it to be successful. I love this rendering. So we've got some people on a porch. We had these design charrettes, and one thing that came through loud and clear was that porches were a part of life. Um, it sounds kind of silly, but this was seen as an essential element. And we were looking for ways to optimize cost, and every developer, every architect we spoke with said, well, these porches could go. And this was absolutely a non-negotiable. Um, the island residents all spoke of sitting on their porch, talking to their neighbors, uh, watching the sunrise, and as such, that's a part of every home. Some of them are open, some of them are screened, but porches were mandatory. Uh, here's some nice uh, living with water imagery. I know I'm, I'm painting a bit of a rosy picture here of this relocation. It was not easy, and we were met with intense skepticism. Um, there's historical mistrust between Native Americans and the government. But there's also specific mistrust where this community has um, 
experienced people telling them that they were going to move them for decades. So every step uh, along the way, when we produce these renderings, when we deliver uh, sites for them to choose from, when we sign the purchase option for uh, the Evergreen site to be, to be bought, at each one of these steps, um, each was a proof point where gradually the skepticism gave way to excitement. Um, this weekend, uh, actually today and tomorrow, residents are um, meeting in a COVID safe and socially distanced manner to choose their interior and exterior color palette. And uh, that's an exciting day for anyone building a house, but the residents are, are elated. It's again showing them that this is becoming a reality. And we have had um, higher levels of participation than we imagined. Our goal was always to relocate everyone from the island, but we knew that that likely wasn't going to happen. We now have 36 households moving into this new, new isle community. Two have opted to relocate elsewhere uh, with our assistance. And we have 17 former households who had moved off the island prior to Hurricane Isaac uh, which was the qualifying event for this HUD money, we we're able to give them uh, a vacant lot in the new community so that they can build their own house and be able to reintegrate with their community. Ultimately, only four households, 10 people, have opted to not participate in this program, which we think is a, an incredible achievement, even though we have some folks who have decided this is not for them. So where are we right now? We're under construction. We are in the midst of infrastructure construction. We have laid roadways. We've laid several miles of subsurface utilities. And we're starting residential construction in March. The move-in is going to be at the, the end of 2021 into early 2022. So briefly, lessons learned here. And there has been a lot. The first one is investing in community-based knowledge and local history. Um, had we known that there were multiple tribes, multiple unaffiliated groups on the island, uh, we wouldn't have been stumbling over ourselves at the start of this. Um, we would have known that we had to create broad consensus across multiple groups. Um, dive in there, get to know your people. Uh, it's going to set you up for success. The other is we were slow to uh, build partners with uh, the local government in the area, and with the business communities and the receiving community. Uh, those were lessons hard learned, uh, and particularly with the receiving community. They heard about the, the development that we were building after we had already committed to it. Um, we weren't in charge of the messaging, and um, when that happens, you know, um, rumors can fill the empty void there. So we had to undo some damage of these residents who went from uh, sort of having a NIMBY outlook to us building in their backyards to being excited about um, really this world-class development that's going to be right down the street from them. And that uh, sort of segues into managing these lines of communication. We found that um, without constant and uh, scheduled communication with all of our stakeholders that um, the rumor mill was active. And we found perhaps that that's because of the degree to which relocation is an emotional process. Um, it's not simply uh, buying up land, building new, packing moving boxes. Um, people are extremely emotionally invested in this process. And we found the more we communicate, the more openness and honesty that we have with the residents, the more successful the process is. Um, our next takeaway was that you got to build administrative capacity. Um, a relocation is multidisciplinary in ways that I never could have imagined. Um, we've had to engage professionals of all varieties in order to create this team that's going to successfully relocate the island community. Um, we, my agency is uh, very experienced in disaster. Um, Louisiana experiences our fair share of disasters, uh, but this was new even for us. 
and we've had to reach out to um, experts in, in fields of tremendous variety. And lastly is the, the co-design process. We are not used to having to uh, engage in a co-design process just because of the nature of our work um, in disaster recovery, we're generally giving grants to communities that are going to uh, then do the design uh, on a local basis to meet their needs. But here, um, we had to, every step of the way, engage with the residents to make sure that we were building a community that they would, um, would enjoy, that they would be proud to call their own, and that would meet their needs long term. So uh, jump on that co-design process right up front. Uh, here's just a lovely picture of our staff and some of our partners. So I am representing the Louisiana Office of Community Development today, but we couldn't have done it without also the Louisiana Housing Corporation, our friends at Terrebonne Parish, and our consultant CSRF. So, uh, Thanks for listening to my whirlwind about this uh, very complex project. Uh, my email address is below, chad.carson at la.gov. You can visit our website. It's ildejohncharles.la.gov um, to get plenty more information. So thank you so much. Great. Okay. We're going to, we have a lot of questions. So we're going to go ahead and get into that. Um, and let us begin. Um, and Rachel, if you're around, I'm not sure if you are, if you want to put um, your webcam back on, that would be helpful. I know you said you had to switch rooms, but um, so first let, let's start with Sally here. Um, <coughs> um, community relocation for coastal communities in the Canadian far north facing similar issues is extremely sensitive given that many of these communities were forced, uh, forcibly relocated in the 60s and 70s. Are similar cultural historical issues at play here in Alaska? Uh, yeah, actually, um, but uh, you know, I think in the communities that I've been working with, I mean, in New Talk in particular, New Talk is, you know, they took the matter into their hands. They did a lot of the um, beginning legwork themselves so government and you know outsiders were out of that picture. They um, made the decision internally to relocate. They based that off of some um, erosion assessments that were done in the 1980s. Um, they went through the whole process of um, identifying criteria for relocation sites and evaluating relocation sites on their own. Um, and then they went through the whole process of gaining site control of their um, of their chosen site the federal government so you know it was a, and I, I think it's really important um, when those beginning steps are in the hands of the community that you know because there is this very um, traumatic and really unfortunate history of um, forced forced relocation um, in uh, tribes and I so I think it's really important that you know we do everything that we can to enable them to make their choices and make it work out the way that they want to. I mean, it's, that's just good practice anyways, because it's their lives that we're, you know, they're going to be living um, there. So it's important for them to feel like they have ownership over the process. But yeah, I think that, you know, part of the sensitivity too is that um, tribes in Alaska were essentially forced to live in villages. They were told that they had to send their um, children to school, and the schools were built at a place that wasn't necessarily, I mean, it certainly wasn't a permanent site. Most of them were in um, temporary subsistence camps, and so it wasn't a place that the people even stayed at all year round. Um, so I think, you know, we have to consider, you know, that's where I, you know, think this is the government's responsibility because of this history, this happened. Um, and also because the United States has a trust responsibility to tribes, and I think that that's part of it. I don't know if I fully answered that question. Sounds good. Um, what is the primary heating fuel in rural Alaska? So um, the primary heating fuel is 
Um, I'm trying to think. <laughs> You're putting me on the spot for something that I'm not. Um, I believe it is um, just. Um, I think that there's different types, and I'll have to. I'll have to find that for sure. But I, I know that there's kerosene. There's, um, you know, un, I think that kerosene is the primary heating fuel. And a lot of people have wood stoves and they'll use those, but that's not, you know, what some of the systems run off of. Could you, and Sally, this one's for you, and then we'll give you a break and we'll move over to Chad. Mm -hmm. um, can you share an overview of demographic trends in the villages that you've worked with over the past 30 plus years? Yeah, so um, it's really interesting. Um, I work mostly with communities in the Yukon Kuskokwim Delta area, and where some er regions of Alaska are losing population, um, the communities in this particular region are pretty much um, retaining population and actually getting larger. So, um, Newtok, for example, um, um, I think it's more than half of the community, or at least half of the community, is under the age of 18. So they tend to be very um, large, you know, they've got lots of children um, and they've got a young population. I don't know if you needed more information on that. That's good. Um, and That's I have to, you know, go ahead. I would just wanted to add one of the reasons why I think that people stay out in the areas is because they're so connected to these areas. So even though they're living in what we consider to be Alaska Native villages now, um, these villages are still in the areas where their ancestors um, moved around for thousands of years. So there's deep, deep connection to these areas. Sure. Um, and if anyone is typing questions in and uh, we're not answering the question right or you have further follow up, just type it in. We'll see if we can get to it. Okay. Um, Sally, I'll give you a break. Chad, you're up. Uh, let's see. Here we go. With these projects, is there a role to be played by mental health professionals to address loss of place? I'm a planner interested in the challenges of climate dislocation from the mental health perspective and how planners can work with mental health professionals to address this need. And I guess this could go for anybody, but Chad, I guess we'll start with you. That's an interesting question. Sure, um, absolutely. Um, we have, um, we're often walking into uh, communities that have unaddressed mental health issues um, due to poverty um, and access to resources, and it's compounded by the relocation process. Um, absolutely, it's a lesson. To be clear, we are not engaged with mental health professionals on this project, um, and it is definitely a lesson learned that we should be. Um, I would advise that any future relocation incorporate social work or a, a similar discipline into their project. Sally, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's well recognized. Um, I think a lot of communities are undergoing a, a lot of stress. I just did something and I can't see you guys now again, but I hope that you can see me. Um, uh, um, you know, the, the threats that are um, impacting communities are very stressful, and that in and of itself um, can increase um, mental health issues. But also, you know, a lot of the extra, um, I talked about some of, of the exacerbated situations where food security and um, um, safety, um, especially for going out and um, traveling places for subsistence resources when you've got um, and, you know, a, an environmental situation that you're not familiar with. Um, and then just, you know, the fear of the future um, and what that holds for you when you're so connected to this place and you don't know what, what your future is going to be um, in staying in this place. So I think it's definitely something that's recognized. It's something that we have addressed in the mitigation framework that I, um, that I talked about at the very end of my presentation. I'm going to try to fiddle with my screen to see if I can see you guys again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so uh, the next question is, and this is for, for both of you, we'll start with Chad though. Um, 
is the relocation completely voluntary? Um, are there any holdouts, people who refuse to move? Great question. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, it is voluntary, completely voluntary. Um, we, my office is working on other relocation projects as well, and they are exclusively voluntary, um, which is a, a mixed bag of getting people to participate. Um, in some ways, it's to our advantage that it's not a forced choice, um, because we do want residents to take uh, ownership of this process and, and be excited about it. Nobody's excited about a forced choice. So that's, that's good. And in general, with these community level relocations, our number of holdouts is very low. Um, we're doing a relocation project in Point Coupee Parish uh, near New Roads. Uh, it's a subdivision called Pecan Acres and it's 40 houses. We've got 39 of them participating and um, we are actually, by the end of the day, I'll know whether or not we got the final one. Um, so we have had success, even with uh, voluntary buyouts, getting a wide, large-scale participation. Sally, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think that self-determination is essential. And um, I, I can't even imagine in Alaska um, anybody talking about forced relocation. It just, you know, communities make these decisions and we're there to help. Um, so um, I think one of the challenges that communities that are looking at relocation face is reaching consensus within the community that relocation is something that everybody wants to do and, and is supportive of. And as in anything, um, you know, you're always going to have some that are that don't agree. But if the majority of people in the community want to move, and that's their decision um, as a body, whether tribal or city or um, whatever, we will be there to support that, yeah. I do have one thing to add. Um, we had a gentleman who told us that the only way he was leaving the island was in a pine box. And we thought, never gonna come around. He's now participating and is relocating to the new community. So, um, I think it shows the power of the process. Yeah. Right. Um, Chad, um, if current residents uh, want to relocate and convert existing housing to a workplace or recreational facility or anything other than housing, um, would that be something that would be allowed? Um, the I don't know exactly how our uh, our covenant is worded, but the we idea is that it's, it's continued to be used for a private use. Um, we're looking for people to be able to still go back to their uh, to their home, but we're not trying to encourage future development of the area, um, say by opening a business um, or making it your Airbnb. Um, and that's a real question that has come up. Okay, uh, Sally, we're gonna jump back to you. Were there any communities you reached out to who were opposed to the measures you presented? Uh, and what was your approach to their concerns? I guess I'm not sure how to take that question because um, the communities that I, that I work with usually typically will come and ask for help from me. Um, and, I've certainly had other agencies or organizations like the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium will be working with the community and they'll want to get me involved to provide planning assistance. But um, no, because it, usually when I get involved, they want me to be there. Um, you know, we have a very strict policy in my agency and we are the local government agency for the state of Alaska that we don't force ourselves upon any community. That's not our role. We're there to support so oh, we wait until I mean we'll offer help and if they don't want it then they'll say fine but um, I don't you know I don't know I mean we try to let the communities drive what the measures are going to be so I'm not quite sure how to answer that question um, and that was a Rachel question so maybe um, I think she might be skipping around doing something in the background but um, oh. <laughs> if you hear us Rachel and you want to uh, clarify just just jump in 
Um, so um, Chad, <laughs> I, I thought this too, isn't a two month housing construction schedule um, rather optimistic? <laughs> Uh, I saw that that slide said two months. That is not accurate. <laughs> um, so we'll be starting in March, and the first batch of homes will be complete uh, in November, and it's going to be in three sets. So November, February, uh, or pardon me, it's October, December, and February 2022. Okay. Um, and before we go on with questions, you both can take a sip of water, take a drink. Um, I'm getting several comments in that the session, they're trying to get their CM credits logged and it's not showing up. Um, I noticed that too, everyone. It, I swear, yes, there, it, there are CM credits for this. Um, I contacted APA. They have been on and off for the last, I don't know, half a year, been having issues with the CM search function. Um, so if you just email me, info at ohioplanning.org, um, I will send you a direct link to log your credits. Um, I actually had to ask for the link myself from APA because I couldn't find it. Uh, so I promise you will get your credits. Okay, moving on. Um, let's see here. Oh, here we go. Okay, how did you determine how far inland to relocate so that relocation would not be necessary as climate change trends continue. So that this is a, a, a one-time move, let's say. Is this for me or for Sally? Oh, for Chad, let's start with Chad. Start with Chad, I'm sorry. Okay. Aren't you, so, uh, aren't, we aren't you listen to my brain? <laughs> we referenced um, another agency's document. Um, our state has a coastal master plan that uh, projects out sea level rise until 2050, and we went well outside of that footprint. Um, we do know that, though, um, just because we're outside of the that 2050 footprint doesn't mean that um, there's not the potential for future flooding. Louisiana had flooding in 2016 in almost all of our county parishes. Um, which is why we're building the homes uh, with elevated foundations. Everyone is up off the ground, no slab construction. Sally, do you have anything to add to that? Can you repeat the question, question for me? Because I, can you repeat the question for me? Because I decided to look up about the, what kind of heating fuel is in rural Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> Which is that sounds, um, propane that is one like of them that I, I didn't mention. Just one, yeah. one, one track, right? Um, the question well, was related to uh, how do you know how how far away to move uh, a, a community so that you don't end up having to do it again if you know there's another uh, climate issue? Well, so this is the reason why um, uh, hazard studies are so important, not just for the community itself to figure out you know is relocation the option that they have or you know can they basically stay where they are for the foreseeable future but also for any relocation site i mean i think that you know having doing erosion and flooding and permafrost studies of that potential site is really important and one thing that i really love is that um the statewide threat assessment that i mentioned it was actually done for the denali commission and it was done by the corps of engineers and university of alaska fairbanks and in the appendices of that, they actually have scopes of work for those types of studies. They have one for flood, one for erosion, one for permafrost. So I think we really need to rely on the science um, for making that kind of determination. I also think, you know, for Alaska Native communities, they, they really want, usually they want to stay within their traditional areas, which includes, you know, a much broader area than the, than the actual footprint of the village. It includes a lot of the different subsistence areas that they go out to um, that um, you know we do rely upon those types of studies before making a final decision and make that available to the community so they can make an informed decision thank you um, let's talk money for the next couple of questions here uh, so first sally can you give us a rundown about how how much money it costs to relocate one of these communities? 
Um, we know, so I don't know the exact amount. I know, you know, approximately what's been spent on New Talk so far, and it's around 60 million. Um, and that's, and it hasn't finished yet. And of course, you have to understand that, you know, building in rural Alaska is extremely expensive. So that cost may not be as high um, if you're talking about a community in the lower 48, but in, in Alaska, it's very high. Chad, do so you have any I, you know, I wouldn't be Oh, go ahead, Sally. Go ahead. I was going to say I wouldn't be surprised if New Talk's um, cost was up to 100 million by the time they're complete, because they've got you know um, airports are extreme. Developing a runway in rural Alaska, developing a school, those are very expensive um, types of infrastructure that cost millions of dollars. So. So for the Ildijon Charles relocation, um, we received $48.3 million from HUD and we're going to spend all of it on the relocation. Okay. Um, and are residents responsible for any of the relocation expenses? And if so, what are they responsible for? I guess, okay, Chad, I let's can, start uh, with you. Take that one on for Ildijon Charles. Um, Long term, they're going to be responsible for um, their, uh, this is a little bit of a challenging question to answer because um, there are old expenses and new expenses, but the, in general, the homeowners are going to have to pay uh, the some amount of their homeowners insurance and flood insurance and property taxes. We're going to be able to offset that um, on an income, a sliding scale basis for the first 10 years. After that, um, our revenue model is a little more uncertain and it's unclear if we'll continue subsidizing it. It depends on the success of our economic ventures. Um, so eventually, over time, the people will be responsible for more of their ongoing costs. But the costs of like moving, We've got that uh, paid for. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see here. How does relocation change when it is not within a tribal or collective dynamic and is instead an incorporated municipality? That's a good question. Um, Sally, do you want to? kick that one off or pun it to Chad, that's up to you. <laughs> I mean, I can, I, I mean, I can tr try to address it. I, you know, it's different because um, an incorporated municipality um, generally would have more resources to, um, you know, to, to ca carry out relocation. But, you know, especially if they, um, in Alaska, if they, um, you know, are revenue based and they have um, revenues coming in, but, um, and, and also just the level of connectedness of people in the community, because a tribal community, obviously, you know, people are much more connected by families and everybody knows each other. Um, there are some very, there are tri Alaska Native villages that are also second class cities. So they are incorporated as a municipality in some cases. There's some that are only, um, they only have a tribal government, but um, so I can't, you know, generalize about all across the board, but if you were talking about um, a non-native um, city in Alaska, I would think, you know, you're going to be dealing with a lot more um, opinions about where to go and whether to stay there. And I would su suspect that you'd have more people that would opt to um, go live in another community. Um, the reason why a lot of Alaska Native villages don't want to do that is because they want to stay together. They want to, you know, continue to have their very separate identity and they're very closely connected. And they feel that, um, you know, all of the things that, that make a tribe a tribe would go away if they got assimilated into a larger community. So um, I think, you know, community, the sense of community is very different between the two often. Chad, do you have anything to add to that? Not really. I think Sally said it really well. Um, I know that some uh, municipalities have moved like this, uh, but 
my agency uh, and myself, I don't have any specific experience with doing that. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see here. Oh, this is good. Are people along the coast having a hard time getting flood insurance or other insurances, or do they even get insurances? In some instances, um, maybe that would be for Sally. Uh, so how, how does that work? And um, that's, that's are there insurance question. companies just pulling right out of the states, saying, oh, I'm not touching this? How does how does that work? Is Can they do that? Well, um, so flood insurance in Alaska is expensive, and the more remote you get, the higher it is. But the other side of this is um, most Alaska Native villages, especially the more traditional ones, have what we call a mixed cash subsistence economy. So a lot of the food is gotten by going out and hunting and fishing and gathering. And then um, if there is money that comes in, um, it's usually not from your typical job that we, you know, we see in a larger uh, metropolitan area. So um, people do not have the cash income in rural Alaska that, um, that people have in um, more urbanized areas, and they don't have the discretionary income to spend on flood insurance, even if they have you know, the opportunity to get it. So very few rural communities participate in the National Flood Insurance Program, so they're not required to get flood insurance. Um, and I, you know, I think that there are some cases of residents in rural Alaska that have purchased flood insurance that are not um, in, in communities that don't participate in the flood insurance program. But, um, you know, first of all, you've got to be an incorporated municipality that can regulate land use um, and re regulate to your flood insurance um, ordinance if you're going to participate in the flood insurance program. And very few rural communities have um, either the, the ability or the administrative capacity to do that. So it's, um, it's a very difficult situation in Alaska. But the big, big thing is very few communities, um, very few residents of rural communities would have the discretionary income to spend on flood insurance. They're having to figure out whether they're going to spend it on fuel or food or, you know, other things that are really important. And I echo that. Um, the residents in Ildijan Charles, to my knowledge, none of them had flood insurance. Um, in, they've been uh, inundated so many times that repairing their home is a part of life, and it's handled on a community level. I will say that now that we're moving, um, the residents are relocating inland uh, outside of the special flood hazard area. We are requiring that they maintain insurance, uh, but compared to the outrageous rates that I assume they would pay on the island, they're going to be at a preferred rate under 400 bucks. Okay. Um, are there selling restrictions on residents selling their home in the relocated community? Chad, we'll start with you. Um, there aren't restrictions per se. Um, they're free to sell their house on day one if they wanted, uh, but that's secured by a forgivable mortgage. So over the course of uh, five years, they gain equity in their house. So at the end of year one, they'll have 20% uh, equity and it's forgiven 20% of the time, one fifth at a time until it's fully forgiven at the end of five years. So we recoup some of our money if it's sold before the end of five years. Sally, anything? I just haven't experienced that. Um, in New Talk, the only situation where homes were bought were in buyouts, and those were FEMA buyouts, and FEMA regulations require that those homes be demolished. So um, they're purchased by FEMA at fair market value. Um, this home has got a certain amount of time before it's demolished, and everything has got to be removed um, to an appropriate landfill. And then um, there's an agreement that, um, I, you know, I'm not exactly sure about in a FEMA case, but I know in many cases um, that ho that property has to be put into like a conservation easement or something like that. So it won't be developed on again because it's in a hazard prone area. 
So I guess then this, there's a kind of a clarification question here. So, and I guess this would probably only be for Chad. So after you move, um, you can't rent your house out to uh, for an Airbnb. Or would that be against the rules? I would say, I guess that's a good the, question. In the new community? I, Is that the I question? Assume. Okay, I we'll all answer it as if that were the question. So okay. um, compliance with our uh, our program is a part of the forgiveness. So you have to maintain it as your primary residence for uh, those five years. And you know we're checking on homestead exemptions and doing other monitoring checks at the end of each of those years. Uh, so if you were to Airbnb it, uh, we're not gonna forgive the forgivable mortgage. But I do hope that our community is so desirable that people are trying to put it on Airbnb. That would be a win, in my opinion. Okay, thank you. Um, it, it is 2.30, we're gonna wrap up. There are still a bunch of questions. So folks, if you have specific questions, feel free to reach out to our panelists um, and I'm sure they would be happy to answer those questions. Um, just a couple quick reminders before you all jump off. Uh, we are recording the session. We'll have it up on our YouTube channel here shortly, and we uh, will have a PDF of the session available on our webcast webpage, ohioplanning.org slash planningwebcast. Um, if you need a link to register those CMs, just email me at info at ohioplanning.org. We're trying to figure out what's going on with those credit, with the credit not function not working. So uh, thanks everyone. Make sure you head over to our webcast webpage to register for future sessions. Uh, and I think that's it. So everyone have a great afternoon, have a great weekend, and we'll talk next time.